Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And the church said, Amen. Well, you may have a seat. I want to welcome you once again to Christian Hills. I'm Pastor Mike, lead pastor here at Christian Hills. And we have been in the book of Revelation since January, by the way. And we have progressed speedily all the way to Revelation chapter 7. So, as you can see, we're not making a whole lot of headway. <laughs> but isn't God been showing up? Amen. <laughs> Amen. And, you know, when God shows up, you know, most of you that were here last week knew that uh, I think it's the first time since I've been here as pastor that I never preach because God's presence was so tangible in the service. Amen. I told my staff, it's always good when I don't preach. Amen? (laughs) Because you know God is there and God's doing something supernatural. Well, we, as we have progressed through this series, we have been learning a lot about who God is, who Jesus Christ is. We have been understanding who Jesus was because Revelation points to the things that Jesus did in the past. But we also understand in the book of Revelation, different topics and different subjects also point us to what Jesus is doing in the church even today in 2018. And then there's also in this phenomenal book a pointing to or a vision or a revelation of what is going to transpire in the future. And so this book, you could say, has it all. It deals with the past, it deals with the present, and it deals with the future. And we need to come to this book with an open heart, We need to come to this book in a prayerful attitude, and we need to ask God to continue to open our eyes because revelation was given to the Apostle John while he was on the prison island of Patmos, and he didn't have a whole lot of food, and he was, you know, most of the people on that island, by the way, were starving to death or dying. It's not like Hawaii. It was just a rock in the middle of the, I think it's the the, the sea there. And and the story goes like this, that God showed up to him when he was in his cave one day in the spirit on the Lord's day, and the Lord Jesus gave him a revelation because at that point, the church was being persecuted. People were dying for their faith. They were losing their jobs, their homes, their lives, their families. And this book was given as a word of inspiration to the church, to the believer, to those who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, so that they could get a fresh revelation of who Jesus was in all of his glory and in all of his might. And that's why we chose Revelation 12, 11 as our theme verse for this entire book of Revelation, which is Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And throughout this book, you will discover over and over that there is a day of reckoning coming. That's judgment day, as people would somehow preach about it for years and years. And and interesting enough, I I was looking through some old sermons. I found a sermon about judgment day by an old individual named James Weldon Johnson. He was an African-American preacher down in the south on a plantation. And he says this one Sunday morning about this thing called Judgment Day. He goes, in that great day, people in that great day, gods are going to rain down fire. Gods are going to sit in the middle of the air to judge the quick and the dead. Early one of these mornings, God's going to call for Gabriel, that tall, bright angel Gabriel, and God's going to say to him, Gabriel, blow your silver trumpet and wake the living nations. And Gabriel's going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? And God's going to call, going to tell him, Gabriel, blow it calm and easy. Then putting one foot on the mountaintop and the other in the middle of the sea, Gabriel's going to stand and blow his horn to wake the living nations. Then God's going to say to him, Gabriel, one more blow your silver trumpet and wake the nations underground. And Gabriel's going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? And God's going to tell him, Gabriel, like seven peals of thunder. Then the tall, bright angel Gabriel will put one foot on the battlements of heaven and the other on the steps of hell, and he will blow that silver trumpet till he shakes 
old hell's foundations. And I feel old earth a shuddering. And I see the graves a bursting. And I hear a sound, a blood chilling sound. What sound is that I hear? It's the clicking together of the dry bones, bone to bone, the dry bones. And I see coming out of the bursting graves and marching up from the valley of death, the army of the dead and the living and the dead and the twinkling of an eye are caught up in the middle of the year before God's judgment day. Amen, right? Amen. That great sermon, by the way, I only shared a tidbit. <laughs> I could go on for an hour. And I read this sermon over a few times this week. I'm like, man, that, that is so anointed. But it's so true. And, and when we think of Judgment Day, you know, a lot of people get kind of a little, a little nervous about Judgment Day. But here's the, here's the amazing thing that as he gets to the end of a sermon that he shared with his congregation that morning. Thank God we found Jesus. Amen. Because <laughs> Judgment Day does not impact the Christian. Judgment Day is not about the Christian. It's about the, the individual who has not accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Because we're going to discover today, as we continue exploring the book of Revelation, that we get delivered from the day of judgment. And you say hallelujah to that, amen? We get delivered from the time when God pours out his wrath when the lamb, it says in Revelation, we read it a couple weeks ago, chapter 6, when the lamb pours out his wrath upon the earth, and it is a day that is coming, and it is a day that God who sits on the throne is going to be in conjunction with the lamb who was slain, and they're going to start opening the seals, and we talked about the six seals that have been opened in the book of Revelation, and what follows after the opening of those seals, and there's judgment, and there's bloodshed, and there's, and there's the prayers of the saints which were crying out for for justice on this earth, for the things and the wrongs that were done to them would be reconciled by the power of God. And that's exactly what was starting to transpire when we left off in chapter 6. So as we look at the seals, we have progressed all the way up to the seventh seal, the one on the right there. And, and we have seen that through the first seal, the white horse would come. He had a bow, he was given a crown, and he went out to conquer. In other words, he was going to go out and drive back all that the evil forces had taken and stolen. Secondly, we discovered the red horse, which is going to be released in 6-4. Peace is going to be removed on this earth because war is going to break out. It's going to be more war going on than in what happened in World War II. And there's going to be violence, and there's going to be breakouts, and there's going to be battles, and there's going to be battles to be fought. And then the third seal is the black horse. And this is, uh, he carries a scale in his hand. And, and there's this idea that in that day, inflation is going to be so bad that, oh, that you will have to work one day just to buy one loaf of bread to be able to feed yourself. And he, that day is coming. Famine, by the way, always follows war. Did you know that? Go look at some of the third world countries around the world. Famine always follows war. And then we have the fourth sale, the pale horses relief. Really. Death has been released, and it says, and Hades trails behind death. Why is that? Because when death rolls across the region and people die without Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Hades, or hell, snatches them in and takes them into eternal punishment forever and ever. And then we know that one quarter of the earth will be killed with sword and famine and death and beasts. We know the fifth seal is released because the martyrs are crying out under the altar. All those who have died for the message of Jesus Christ from the time Jesus Christ died on the cross till the current time of when this happens. God says, I have heard their voices, I have heard their cry for justice, and I will respond on their behalf. And then we know that uh, many of them are killed, but the Lord says in that passage, it's not yet, just wait, a time is coming. There is a day of reckoning coming. There is a day. People think it's a myth. People think it's not true, but there is a day of reckoning coming to this earth. And it's closer than you think it is. Just look at the signs of the times. It was interesting. I went to... International House of Prayer Kansas City was at Oak Brook Community Church Friday night and Saturday. And so I went up Friday night, and the power of the Holy Spirit was there. And we were crying out for one specific place. 
It was for Chicago, for a revival to break out in Chicago. And I would say on Friday night, there was 250 people there. 95% of them were under 25. 95% of those interceding and praying for Chicago were young people. And I'm just walking around. I'm blown away. Like, this is all young people. And they are interceding for salvation, deliverance to come to the city. Interesting, as we were done, International House of Prayer Chicago has decided to designate the week of August 19th through August 26th as Love the City of Chicago Week. As of right now, there is over 100 prayer meetings scheduled to happen that week for the city of Chicago. And we joined up to be one of those places, by the way. So we will be hosting a prayer meeting here on Tuesday night of that week. And I find it interesting that the speaker that night, whose name was Matt, I had never met Matt before, shared something that kind of blew my mind. He says, if you don't realize we are in a very unusual hour, then you don't know your church history. He says, from the time that Christ died on the cross to the time that we live today, the things and the phenomena that are happening worldwide have never happened before. He said, less than 10 years ago, that's what he says, less than 10 years ago, there were 25 all-day, all-night prayer meetings happening globally, 25. That was 10 years ago. Just 10 years. Now, these are houses of prayer that are going seven days a week, 24 hours a day. He said there was only 25 of them globally that they know of. Do you want to know how many there are today that they know of? 10,000 in a 10-year period. And he said that night to that young crowd of people, he says, do you realize you are in a pitiful moment of Christian history right now? Because there has never been a phenomenon like this ever before on the face of the earth since the time that Jesus died. What they feel, that many people praying and crying out to God for revival for this nation and for this world. And I had to think about that. I thought, you know, that is pretty amazing because I know my church history. I have heard of different places that have had prayer meetings and revival meetings that lasted for a short amount of time. But what he was really pressing is there is over 10,000 of them that have been going for years and years and years, endless prayer and worship to God with no stopping. That is unprecedented in, in church history. That many people. That many people, and here's the interesting thing he said to that young crowd. It's your generation that's crying out to God to do something. So here's my challenge to this congregation. It's time for us middle-agers, I'm not calling myself a senior yet, and us seniors to get on the bandwagon, amen? Get on the prayer wagon and start praying. Because that is what's going to transform our country. And that's why we need to know the signs and the times because the martyrs' prayers are being answered. Amen? These young people's prayers in these prayer meetings, God is going to answer. And let's go to the next one. The sixth seal is the celestial signs in the end time that he's about to come back. Earthquakes. The sun darkens and turns blood red. Stars fall from the sky. The sky recedes like a scroll. So there's this catastrophic thing that's going to happen prior to the opening of the very last seal. And some people believe, some theologians believe that is a major nuclear war. Because if you look at that chapter, you look at that section, it really describes almost the nuclear war. How many of you know that's going to bring revival? Can you imagine a nuclear war anywhere in this world wouldn't bring revival? The evil would be so... So brought into the light when that thing happens that people are going to drop through their knees and cry out to God to come. Well, today we are going to be in the seventh seal, which is going to be released. And there's, there's a few things that happen in here. So turn with me to the book of Revelation. Uh, we are in Revelation chapter 7. 
There's a few things that are going to transpire before the opening of this seal, and I just want to kind of highlight them to you. But I want to bring you back to the very first, what I call, beatitude or blessing that I have spoken about. There's seven, seven blessings that are spoken about in the book of Revelation. I read you this text a while back, but I want to refresh your memory to remind you of how important it is to read the Word of God. Listen to what it says. Revelation 1.3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. You can skip that verse so many times and not realize how important it is to hear the word of God, to hear it out loud. And so we're going to read it, Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. And by the way, we have opened all, the lamb, the slain lamb, spoken about in Revelation, has opened all of these six seals. So all of them have been opened. Judgment is starting to progress toward the earth. It's coming on the earth. So after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of judgment, by the way, of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Now, there, there's this pausing that's been happening in heaven. It's all being released. It's all been done. By the way, Jesus has already released a lot of these seals. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power, that's the four that we talked about, the four horsemen, to harm the land and the seas. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. That's you and I. So there's this holding back until God has placed the seal on his people, on those who want to follow him. And you're marked. Oh, you are marked. You're marked by God as belonging to him, part of his family, part of the royal party of the, uh, of the priests of this last day, part of his prophets who are messengers of his love, mercy, and grace. You get a seal. Now, we know there's this 144,000 that is spoken about at the very end time, which I think is representative of the church of that day and those that will be bringing the message in the final hour. But there's this idea in this passage, you can't overlook it, is that God is going to place a seal on us, or he has placed a seal on us because we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. I think that deserves an amen. See, do you realize who you belong to? I mean, Jemonica talked about it in her testimony. Do you actually realize who your heavenly father is? Do you realize what he has done for you as your heavenly father? And there's this aspect of what they're saying here and what I see and what I pick up is not just what's going to happen in the future. And there is a futuristic time frame of this whole event coming to pass. But the event has already been taken place where God is placing his seals on his people. How do I know that? Well, because scripture tells me that. You can go back into 2 Timothy 2.19. It says, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. And there's this idea in there that God has a seal on his people when he knows they have turned away from wickedness. There is his sign, his seal on them. They belong to him. And get this, no demon, no judgment, nothing the world can throw at you can literally harm you because you have God's seal on you. Yeah, they may take your life, like those whose lives are being taken. But you know what Jesus said? Praise God, the second death won't hurt you. You just get to go to heaven quicker. And I think it's all about perspective. I think it's about understanding who we are. It's about understanding what's happening and transpiring in this day and in this hour. Because I do believe Jesus is coming back sooner than you think. I think even sooner than I think. Then I heard the number, and you can read those passages there, and it kind of relates to the different tribes of Judah and the 144,000 getting the seal. 
Once again, I also think it relates to the church of Jesus Christ. And then we have this next kind of picture scene of the throne in heaven in verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. John sees this great multitude before the throne after the sealing of these 144,000. No one could count. No one could count how large this crowd was. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And, and I want you to picturesque this scenario here because it says that they're what? They're, 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 I'm going to grab a palm branch here. So there's these people, there's this great multitude in heaven. They're dressed in white robes. We know any time that a white robe is mentioned in Scripture means that the individual has been purified, made holy, and it says, by the blood of the Lamb. And so this, this crowd is waving palm branches, and they're, they're saying this to God, and I want you to see the picture. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and they're just waving these palm Does that sound familiar? You got to go back to Palm Sunday. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on the donkey and all the people were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then they were throwing cloaks on the ground and they were waving palm branches and throwing them down. But you got to remember what happened to that crowd. Anybody remember what happened to that crowd? Within one week, what happened? They were no longer singing Hosanna, glory, holy is the Lord. They were saying, crucify him. Can I tell you something? This crowd's never going to do that. This crowd's never going to do it. Salvation belongs to our God, they're singing. And they're waving the palm branches. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then the angels who were around the throne, you've got to go back. If you've been with us, you've been seeing this picture view of this throne in heaven. It's got four living creatures that they kind of fly around the throne and they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And then there's all these angelic hosts of angels that are singing how majestic, how worthy. I, I read some of those to you. In the beginning of our prayer time today, they would sing things like, holy is a lamb and worthy is a lamb to take the scroll and to redeem mankind. And they're singing all these different songs. It says they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, so be it. It will be done. Truly listen to this. This is what's going to happen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's it. It's final. It's going to happen. You can believe it's not going to happen. You can preach against it. You can try and work against it. You can fight against it. But you will not stop God from what he's going to do to this earth. I don't care. There's no demon, no president. There's no liberal, there's no perverted person. Nobody is going to stop the judgment of God that is going to come upon this place. Nobody. The devil himself, Satan himself cannot stop God. God is going to have his way. God is going to redeem this world. God is going to judge this world. And every person who has done sin that they have not repented of will face the judgment seat. That's why it's such important for us to get the message out now that you can repent and ask Jesus to forgive you. And Jesus says, I love you. I'll forgive you. Then one of the elders asked me, because John's having this old vision, these in white robes, who are they? He's talking to John, this angel. And where did they come from? I answered, you know, John's probably like, sir, you know, because I really have no idea <laughs> where they came from. I'm kind of in this vision thing. I'm on the island. I have no idea. He answers his own question, of course. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I want to pause. I know there's been a lot of teaching on what is a great tribulation. The Greek word is thelipsis. A great tribulation is when anybody dies or is persecuted for standing up for Jesus Christ. Can I tell you when the Great Tribulation started? There is a Great Tribulation coming at the end of time, absolutely. The time Jesus died on the cross, 
set in motion a great tribulation for a lot of Christians. That's why we're reading the book of Revelation and you hear of all the people who died and were martyred in Roman Colosseums and were hung on crosses and were allowed to have wild beasts tear them apart for their confession of who Jesus Christ is. See, we are so marshmallowy in America, we have no clue what persecution is. But can I tell you something? If you haven't seen it, it's coming. Because in this last day that God is pouring out his spirit, you better believe the light will get lighter and the dark will get darker. There will be no more middle ground. You will be either with the Lord or against the Lord. There's no neutrality in the middle in spite of what the media tells you, in spite of what your friends tell you, in spite of what your family tells you. There's no middle ground. You're either on one side or the other. And, and I want you to think about this for a moment. Who are these people, these great cloud, these, all these people? Well, it says they came from every nation. Every nation. Yeah, do you have any idea how many nations there are in the world today? Anybody got a clue? You can shout it out. 104, okay. 243, okay. All right, we're close, right in the ballpark. Today in the world, there are 195 nations today. By the way, how many nations in history? Because not all the nations that exist today existed before, and some nations that used to exist no longer exist. So if you do a little mathematical calculation with a little bit of guessing, you come to somewhere around over a 1,000 nations have vanished from the earth. And can I tell you this? Every single one of those nations will have a representative that will be part of this great multitude in heaven. Then it says this about the great multitude. They came from every tribe. You want to guess how many tribes there are in the world today? 150 trillion tribes. So that means from every tribe, there will be a representative, if not many or more representatives, of those who are before the throne. Now, if, the math, if math hasn't started to baffle your mind yet, you've you got to understand that this is a reality. You in your lifetime cannot count to a billion. You can start counting now, and I guarantee you, you won't get there by the time, you're di by the time you die. And then take trillion on top of that. That's a lot. Somebody said, I'm going to take the challenge. Pastor Mike, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to try and count to a billion before I die. Well, good luck on that one. Amen. <laughs> so there's this great cloud of witnesses before heaven, before the throne, before the Lamb. And it says they came from every nation and every tribe. Anybody know how many tribes have not been reached by the gospel in our day and era? How many tribes have not heard the gospel today? This will blow your mind. There are less than 100 tribes in the entire world that have not heard the gospel. Less than 100. The prediction by Mission Maker Magazine is by 2020, all tribes on this planet will have heard the gospel. That is unprecedented in the history of Christianity that that has ever happened before. And it's going to happen in our lifetime. What did Jesus say? That his second coming would happen when the whole world knew. That's coming to pass in 2020. So I'm just saying you better be ready. Because this is your lifetime that these things are going to transpire. They came from every people group. How many people groups are there in the world today? 24,000 people groups, they say. How many throughout history? Couldn't get an answer to that one. They all spoke numerous languages. How many languages in the world today? Anybody know? How many languages spoken in the world today? Okay. 6,909. 6,909 languages according to this thing I looked up. By the way, one language dies every 14 days. One language dies every 14 days. So by the way, there are probably over 100,000 is the best guess to how many people spoke different languages throughout the history of the world. So all those people are going to be represented in this great cloud 
of witnesses dressed in white robes, washed by the blood of the Lamb, made holy and pure to be able to stand before the throne of God, waving palm branches and praising him. So what does that all mean? What does it mean, this great cloud of witnesses, that all these people have to be sealed? Because those who are sealed by God, those who belong to God, those who God has said they are mine, will be protected. They will be, they will be spared the great judgment that is coming on this world. What does that all mean? It basically means what Revelation has been telling us all along, we need to be ready, amen? We need to make sure our hearts are in the right place and in the right position with Jesus Christ. Because the time of judgment is a coming. And you can deny it. You can put your head in the sand. You can run from it. You can pretend it doesn't exist. But I guarantee you, things are ramping up in our day. More people are dying for the gospel of Jesus Christ today than throughout the history of Christianity. People are being martyred all over this planet because of their testimony of Jesus Christ. And it's rising. And it all points to this end time. It points to this coming back of Jesus. It points to a time when we need to be ready. And so when we get to the uh, chapter 8, we have the Lamb opening the seventh seal, the last seal of judgment that's coming on the earth. And what happens? Well, let's read it. Chapter 8, I'm almost out of time. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 5, if you have your Bibles with you. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Imagine that. Have you remember what's happening around the throne day and night? People praising God, angels singing, holy, 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 worship going on. And then all of a sudden after the lamb opens the seventh seal, which is going to unleash all the judgment upon this world, there's silence. I have a question. Does silence make you uncomfortable? No? Some are shaking their heads, No? Some are like, mm, as long as I have my phone, I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry, no phone. No computer. I'm, I'm just, just saying, silence. The other day, I kind of went and s sat out on the steps for half an hour. Might have been longer. Nobody talked to me. There wasn't silence because the cars just kept going vroom, 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 back and forth. I thought silence in heaven for a half an hour. What were they doing? What do you think the angels were saying? Were they whispering? What do you think is going to happen? What's going on? It's kind of quiet around here. And then I went to IHOP Friday night. Matt said this in his message. We live in a generation of distractions. And he said, a lot of people in our generation, both young and old, are distracted by all the noise, by all the busyness, by the cell phones, the websites, all kinds of things distract them. And they don't have the ability to come to a prayer meeting and cry out to God for more than five minutes because it's too quiet. It's too silent. Not that these things are evil, but the devil uses them as distractions to keep us from connecting with God. So there's silence. By the way, the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent, 
by the way. You know, when God's silent, we should be listening. Amen? What does it say? And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. By the way, silence is coming to an end. <laughs> Whenever you hand somebody a bunch of trumpets, how many know? Silence is coming to an end. I remember when my kids were handed their instruments for band. I knew my tranquility of silence in my home was coming to an end. Especially when they first started playing them. So silence is coming to an end in heaven. The time to listen is over. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke on the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it onto the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Can I tell you something? Every prayer we pray will be heard at the throne room of heaven. That's what this verse tells me. Every prayer you prayed today will be heard at the throne room of heaven. And God will respond appropriately to all the prayers of injustice and all the things that were done uh, in, that were wrong to you and the sin and everything. There is a judgment day coming, and when the silence is over in heaven and it is released onto this world, it says that as a result of this, I believe God listens to all these prayers and then he sends his response that is going to shake this world. And I believe we're on the verge of that great revival very soon. It is going to be a shaking of this world. There's going to be a judgment that's going to come to this world when Jesus comes back. And I guess my question is to you is, are you ready? Are you really ready? Are you living in fantasy land? Some of you live so much in fantasy land because you live on computers and you live in games and you don't live in the world world. Can I tell you something? The world world was designed by Jesus Christ, was designed by God the Father, was designed for you to interact with it so that you could share the message that he has given you with others. And I'm going to keep trumpeting that message, by the way, because the Lord told me this church will be filled when my people decide to start inviting people to church so they can get saved. You know there's people all around you that don't know Jesus Christ. And I pray that you really love them. Love them enough to invite them to church. Love them enough to pray for them. Love them enough to show them the truth. Because when that happens, we're going to see people get saved, set free, freed from the bondages of sin, the effects of sin, the ramifications of sin. And so we really need to know from this message that if we are truly believers in Jesus Christ, we have been sealed by God. And therefore, we, we run away from wickedness. We don't play with it. It means that we are protected by God if we choose to run away from wickedness and not have anything to do with this. We have a seal. We have a protection on us. We receive the gift of mercy and grace, which should compel us to praise the Lamb on Sunday mornings or services or in your car listening. You should really want to praise the Lamb because you are being delivered from the judgment that is coming to this world. You should want to do that. And if you can't praise God on his holy day, what do you think is going to happen when your day comes a reckoning? I'm just saying. Oh, I'm out of time. But I'm going to end. I believe God wants us to jump aboard Love Chicago. But for us to get ready to be able to love Chicago requires us to offer up prayers to God. So in the month of June, we're going to host a couple special prayer meetings. Now, we're going to encourage people to come out and pray. Then we're going to host a series of prayer meetings on Tuesday night in August that are going to lead up to that final prayer meeting that's going to be the, the great outreach that's going to happen because it's not only... Over 100 prayer meetings are going to happen throughout the city of Chicago. Part of it is to mobilize outreach teams that will go out and witness and pray for people and bring people to different churches for salvation to be just unleashed in the Chicagoland area. 
And I find it interesting that this was laid upon the burden of the people who lead up IHOP in Chicago. And then I think about what's happening in Atlanta, at IHOP in Atlanta. And it's almost like without them even talking to each other, there's this thing rising up where all these cities are going to be held up before God that specific week. Wow, isn't that amazing? And it's not just International House Prayer. It's, it's many other groups, many other denominations, many other groups that are coming together to do this. We have, from what I've met, there's Baptists, there's, there's all kinds of different groups that are coming to be a part of this because every single person I talk to know that we need revival. So my challenge is, are you ready to step up to the plate and pray? Are you ready to sacrifice by praying? And we'll have worship too. But I do guarantee you there will be times of silence as well. But I'm really praying we get ramped up for this. Amen? I could keep preaching, but I'm not. I'm not telling you the same. Thank you, God. I'm hungry. So let's stand. Here's my question. This is for you. What would happen if for an entire week we completely abandoned ourselves to heaven? No busyness. No entertainment. No cell phones. <laughs> Some of you are already breathing heavy. No computers. For the older generation, no TV. One week. For one week, we intercede and pray for our cities in the Chicagoland area. Do you believe God will move? Do you believe God would do something? I do. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Do you? Do you want your neighbor to go to hell? Some of you say, well, well kind of. <laughs> that annoys me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would stir a spirit of intercession and prayer within this congregation, Lord, for the city of Chicago and all of us other cities that surround Chicago. I pray that we would love the Chicago land area pray that we would love everybody in these communities around us. Love them enough to tell them about Jesus. Love them enough to pray for them. Love them enough to show them the way. Love them enough to believe that God can change their lives. Lord, I pray you release that spirit of intercession upon each and every one of us. And I pray we would see a transformation happen in our church and school, in our communities and on our street that we would see revival sweep across this entire region, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And then I'm going to ask for a commitment. How many will pray? Raise your hand. Remember, it's between you and God. I don't, it's not for me. All right, raise your hand. So come on, put them up there. This is, this is between you and God. Lord, you see every hand that's being raised up, every person making a commitment to pray and intercede for the city of Chicago. And that starts today. Yes, we're going to do it systematically over the next few months, but it starts today, Lord, with us praying for our city, praying for our community, praying for our families, praying for our neighbor, praying for our schoolmates, Lord, praying for the people we work with. Lord, I pray that we would see a great harvest come into this church, a great harvest to come into all the churches that are involved in this prayer time and praying and loving Chicago. I pray Southside would see a great revival of harvest, a great showing up of God's signs and wonders as well, that people would know that God is God and nobody can stand against him, not even the devil himself. There's nobody that can stand against the power of the Lord God Almighty. So Lord, release that through each person with their hand up today. And I ask that you would do a supernatural thing in this church and their hearts and their families, homes and communities. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. Sorry for keeping you a little extra. We do have the dinner downstairs in the uh, gymnasium. It's roast beef sandwiches, hot dogs and stuff to help send our team to Mexico. God bless. If you need prayer, my wife and I are down front. We'll be happy to pray with you.